Okay, let's continue with the last lecture of Sasha. Thank you. It works? Yeah. Uh, today I will uh, be talking about uh, something quite uh, unrelated to the subject of the first three lectures, namely, in the, let me remind you, first we discuss this universal infrared uh, aspects which do not depend uh, on the UV details of the theory, and uh, that's why they're so universal. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, whatever the theory is, we know that at long distances it reduces to Einstein theory. But of course, for string theory as well, it's very interesting what happens at intermediate energies or high energies, namely what is the UV completion of, the, of gravity, what is the theory at high energies. Uh, of course, this is a very hard question, and uh, uh, especially we don't have an experiment. So a version of the question which uh, is, seems to be promising and very popular uh, is to, uh, to understand what are, the, what are the consistent low energy effective field theories which admit a UV completion. So sometimes uh, this consistent, this question is called, I guess, landscape versus swampland, uh, which is a uh, landscape being a low energy effective field theory which do admit UV completion and the swampland being the theories which looks a priori, they look fine, but if you try to make them gravitational, make them UV complete, you run into some problems. Uh, of course, uh, figuring out what are the borders between swampland and landscape, uh, it's a very hard problem. Uh, but today I would like to talk about the version um, of the problem which is a classical, which is that I will not, don't want to talk about quantum swampland, but sort of consider a classical theory. Say so we start with, a, uh, um, with the Einstein theory. <coughs> and uh, we add to it some high derivative correction. Let me write an example, some famous example. But you can imagine all kinds of terms. This term called uh, uh, this term is called the uh, gauss bonnet term. It has two uh, two prominent features. First, in four dimensions, when uh, when d equal four, when d equal to four, uh, it is topological. And also, if you if you consider equations of motion and some background. The perturbations are second order still. So it's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's one correction, but the question which I would be having in mind is completely general, which is that imagine that uh, you have some, some theory with many high derivative corrections, maybe extra particles, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, how can we constrain these theories? What, are the, what is the landscape of consistent classical theories of gravity? So important point here, when, I, when I, uh, I want to emphasize that this question is classical, by this I mean that we have a, say, Planck scale, which controls quantum corrections, which would be very high. Uh, and there is an extra scale, which is more like a string scale, which controls this extra high derivative corrections. So I will be always working to leading order in the Planck scale, but to say to order order in string scale. That's. Um, that's uh, an important point. And of course, an example of such theory which, which has this kind of corrections is a string theory. That's one example. And uh, from the studies of these questions, there are two um, sort of two messages maybe uh, that one can, what can uh, see is first that uh, this type of high derivative corrections uh, for theory to be consistent, you need the uh, higher spin particles. You need an infinite number of uh, higher spin particles. <clears throat> and the uh, higher spin, I mean here spin larger than two. And let me remind you that graviton is a spin two. That's a graviton. It's the first thing which I would be uh, uh, talking today, and it's related to, again, some 
as the previous lectures were some modern twist on uh, old topics, this will be also uh, some modern twist on the uh, old subjects, old uh, general relativity experiments. And the second uh, message, which uh, I don't have time so much to explain, is that if you think about uh, this classical theories of high spin particles, they in certain th things, they, they, uh, they have strings, there's uh, theories of strings. It would be nice to turn it into a theorem and uh, or to prove that if you wish that the string theory of strings is this universal mechanism of having uh, consistent interacting theories of hard spin particles. So it's not that you, well, you, there are probably many ways to, uh, to end up in string theory, but from this point of view, you start with this problem, you correct gravities and you want it to be consistent, and you, you see that the only way you can do it is to have strings classically. Of course, uh, I'm not proving here that string theory is a theory of the universe because, uh, because it's a classical problem. But if you can do something like that for, for the full quantum theory, of course, that would be something very great for, for string theorists. So that's um, so the messages, and I will talk today about this because it involves many sort of simple and classical experiments, uh, structures. If you, any questions? This was the motivation. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, uh, so by this I mean that uh, it has, uh, at the moment that it has infinitely, infinitely many, uh, say, asymptotically linear regular trajectories. And uh, that, uh, well, and all the other predictions of effective theories of strings, but uh, I, I don't know how to prove that. So far I know only that, say, you can show that the four-point amplitude in some universal region looks like Veneziano. Okay, that's... That's, uh, that's what I mean, yeah. That's what probably, well, ideally one would like to show more. That's what I mean at the moment. The object which I would like to discuss today, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, scattering amplitudes. It's a nice object because it, uh, if you're dealing with, uh, with you're dealing with the actions, there are field redefinitions. But if you want to talk about invariant data, it's, uh, it's packaged in the scattering amplitudes. So the object which we would like to discuss is a two to two scattering. And uh, the S matrix is usually written like this. It's one plus IT. Uh, it's unitary. Well, I will not use it too much. At least in this sense. And uh, the T has a sum of a momenta times an amplitude. Amplitude is a function of Mandelstam invariance. Usual. There. Okay, what is the source of the problem? Why is it, why is it that suddenly we started with a, with a theory and uh, we would like to constrain it? So what would be the, where would the juice is coming from? How do we get these constraints? How do we get these claims? Uh, to do that, it's useful to recall some basic facts about scattering amplitudes, and then, um, and then we will find that uh, what, what is special about gravity and uh, high spin particles is uh, its high energy behavior. And as we will see that the high energy behavior is very uh, constraining. So recall that if you have a, let me start with something simple, that you have a, if you have a, a two particles, and you exchange particle with a spin j. You can show you can compute the amplitude. Then uh, this diagram behaves as t s to the j. This is a known fact. Uh, well, if you 
simplest example is consider a scalar field. Then you have a, take this diagram, it will be equal to one over T, which is at large S behaves uh, like S to Z zero. Now you can consider uh, instead of uh, a, useful, a useful formula is to, or a useful experiment would be to consider instead of scattering in momentum space, imagine two wave packets. Uh, so we have particle one and two, which are separated by some distance b. That's, uh, that's now, you imagine two wave packets which in the transverse space separated by distance b. And, uh, yep. Yeah. So you have you can if we add the diagram it will be one over s. Yeah. But at large energies this dominates. Yeah. Um, now in the in the impact parameter space, oh, sorry, this guy is called impact parameter. Uh, in the impact parameter space, uh, the s matrix takes this form. One plus say i delta. Delta is called a phase shift, and this one is the same one, but this one is secretly a bunch of delta functions, uh, and this one is literally one. And the phase shift is related uh, as it follows to the scattering amplitude. It's one over two s integral over transverse transverse momenta, and you take an amplitude some s and t minus q squared. So S, you, you think about it as just the energy of a scattering, and Q is the exchange momentum. So if you do a Fourier transform, oh, something is missing. If you do a Fourier transform with respect to exchange momentum, you get a phase shift. Now, wh where is the problem, where the problem comes from? So the problem would, uh, would, like, would like to, Impulse is, uh, is causality, for example, that we want our theory to be causal. And uh, to motivate it in two steps, let me first think, uh, you can think of scattering as a, as a, especially if it's a high energy scattering, where there is no much deflection going on, particles just acquire some phases, which, then you can think of uh, scattering as a propagation through the medium. So imagine I send uh, many particles. And, uh, and then you send a probe. So you can think from the point of view of these particles, this other, this other particles is just a medium. And then we would like this medium to be uh, such that the propagation is causal. Say it's not faster than speed of light. Uh, a simple model to, to think about when we think about propagation through medium, through the medium is, uh, is to think about some signals. Imagine you send a, you have a black box. In this case, this black box can be made of gravitons. So this black box made of gravitons uh, transforms ingoing signal to outgoing signal. Then, uh, well, let me consider the following model and you can then show that it's a good model for this. We can uh, imagine that the black, this uh, black box does, um, transforms a signal through some S matrix. Or uh, it is uh, it is diagonal. It is diagonal in the in the Fourier space. So f out of omega is equal to s of omega f in. And let's so let me imagine that, and this is related to to the unitarity of the original S matrix, that this uh, uh, that this uh, so this medium cannot uh, uh, increase, uh, if you wish, the, the amplitude of the signal, namely that, uh, well, 
in this language, the unitarity, uh, unitarity is a statement that um, the norm of the L2 norm of the outgoing signal will be less or equal uh, of the ingoing signal. So now, if you uh, you can ask, okay, what are the constraints? What are the constraints from causality and this unitarity on this S matrix? Well, that's a simple problem. Some of uh, probably you all have seen that that it's a, for example, if you take a, if you take an ingoing signal that to be zero for negative times, then you want the outgoing signal to be also zero. negative times. So if you, send, if you send some signal from time zero, you cannot get outcome before. That's, what, that's a statement of causality here. Uh, this uh, implies that this S matrix uh, is analytic in upper half plane in omega. And together, if you, if you, but you can imagine that S of omega is uh, something uh, which is analytic in upper half plane, but it can be some growing function. But you can show also that this unitarity, it's a simple exercise, um, that it's, uh, if you go to the upper half plane, that it's less than one. It can only decay. Otherwise, you will get that uh, the, the norm will be growing. So this is a kind of medium we would like to have. And now we can think of the scattering amplitudes. If we, if we, if we imagine this uh, set of scattering events, yeah. I, I, let me repeat again everything what I'm saying here. I consider the signal model where uh, the incoming signal is transformed to the outcoming signal through the S matrix, which is a function of omega. I assume that it's unitary, and by unitarity here I mean that the norm of the outgoing function is less or equal than the ingoing function. And uh, now I impose that this, um, this S of omega is causal. Namely that uh, for if the incoming, if the incoming signal is zero, then outgoing is zero, and then that it's unitary. And I'm saying that the condition that S of omega should satisfy, it's, it's analytic in upper half plane, the first condition. And moreover, it uh, decreases in upper half plane, so it's less than one when you go to the upper half plane. For example, you cannot have something like e to the i omega cube. This is analytic in upper half plane, but it blows up in some directions in upper half plane. On the other hand, you can have something like this. This is analytic in upper half plane, but it decays in upper half plane. This is related to the uh, difference between particles of spin two and higher, as we will see now. Now, it's a little bit of work, but uh, morally you can see it even from here that you can think of the, uh, of the scattering events as this, this, this medium and uh, that providing this S of omega with S of omega being controlled by delta. And then we, uh, we see that um, the condition of this type that S of omega is less than one becomes in our model something like one plus i delta s of b should be less or equal than one in upper half plane. So, yeah, you can say s is s naught plus some i gamma. Recall again that we said that uh, if we exchange a particle of j, and this model is good at high energies, so particle just brush through each other without deflection. Uh, so what happens if we imagine that this is a, we exchange some particle with spin j? Well, this thing becomes one plus i c s j minus one plus equal than one. Now you can see the following things. Well, first, uh, uh, you can consider, and here I'm working to first order in c because um, uh, I assume that this is a small phase, otherwise I have to um, say 
Yeah, I assume that a couple of these weeks I'm working to first order in C. Now you see that something special happens for, say, let's take, uh, uh, let me take, say, j equal 2. And uh, this s, this is Mandelstam s. It's, uh, it's uh, roughly times, times some number, a product of energy of a particle of a probe times the energy of a particle of a medium here. That's a scattering event here, delta, 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 which we repeat many times, say. And uh, uh, this energy of a probe plays the role of this omega here. And uh, you get that the, uh, the causality constraint becomes the analyticity of this thing in the, in, in the upper half plane in this way. So you, you can think, uh, you can connect the scattering through with a signal model, and you get that the phase shift should be analytic in the upper half plane in the S variable. And you see that if you take uh, J equal to 2, that it, this, is imply, this implies that C is positive. And uh, as we will see, this is related to the fact that the gravity is attractive. Um, then if uh, j larger than 2, uh, this is always violated. You will always find a direction in a complex plane where it grows, no matter what c is. It's bad. And this is related to the fact that higher spin particles are problematic by itself. So it's very constraining. As, as soon as you add one higher spin particle, you should add infinite number of them. Because imagine you just added one higher spin particle, then it grows like s to the j. Then you will violate this, we are in trouble. That's why when we add one higher spin particle, they always come infinite number of them. Sorry? Yeah, so the, well, it fixes roughly that you have to resum, and when you resum, it becomes softer, so like in string theory. So this is not a correct formula anymore. We have to, have to resum infinite number of particles, and uh, they, they resum in phase is in such a special way, such that uh, high energy amplitude becomes small. Well, maybe it's not the correct model, but you can imagine something. Oh, it's you resum x to the n, and there is a finite radius of convergence, but the large x asymptotic is controlled by it. Now you can ask what happens. Yeah. Yeah, here, here is a, this is a, this is a, in the upper half plane, so it's, an, an, it's not physical region. Uh, it's, uh, well, it should not because it's a two to two scattering and you can create other particles. So, yeah. It, uh, if, if scattering is purely elastic, it will be one. But generically, it will be less than one. You can ask what happens to j equal zero and j equal one. Well, for j equal one, this is a pure phase. And to first order in C, the absolute value will be one. Uh, so this, if, we, if we exchange a photon, first order in C, this is not, not a problem. And if, if J equals zero, if you exchange a scalar, you can, if you carefully go through this model, so I, I, I kind of use the connection of the scattering with the signal model, and you can show that for the scalars, this connection is not, doesn't quite work. Uh, but uh, the, the message from here is that we see that uh, uh, when we have a graviton, we, uh, we, have, we, have, we have fine potentially, and when we have higher spin particles, we have to worry. This is a, a, that's a, a, the source of these constraints on the classical landscape, landscape of classical theories of gravity and high derivative corrections. And the idea will be roughly that as soon as you start adding the higher spin, as soon as you start correcting the gravity, you can find a regime where the C becomes negative, or you will violate causality in this medium. And then when you will try to fix the problem, uh, we would have to add all of these guys, but each, each of them is by itself problematic, so we'll have to infinite number of them, and then the problem is fixed. That, that's a, uh, the idea. 
And then we can study these theories of these higher spin particles by themselves and try to see what are the conditions that uh, they resum up correctly and don't spoil the high energy behavior. Let me explain a little bit uh, in more why, why is it related to causality and uh, what do we mean when we talk about causality and gravity? Because, uh, well, in gravity, you can say the space-time fluctuates. So what is, a, what is what, what, what do I mean when I say causality? And here is a notion of causality and gravity, which I'm having in mind, is what is called, um, what is called asymptotic causality. And, um, This is due to uh, uh, Gao and Wald, paper about time delays. And the statement of asymptotic causality is, uh, well, the idea is, as we also discussed in the previous lectures, that uh, far away, uh, so space-time fluctuates, but if you go far away, you have a rigid asymptotic structure. So for us, it was Minkowski space. And uh, the idea is that we, we cannot send signals uh, faster than what is allowed by the asymptotic structure. What is allowed Uh, by the asymptotic causal structure. So Wald and Gao, uh, they actually were uh, proving theorems. So you assume uh, you start with GR, and you add some matter which satisfies now energy condition, and then you can show that, uh, the, the, when, when you say, let, let me draw, a, a, say, the simplest, the cleanest thing is, a, is to consider ADS. So ADS is a gravitational box. So asymptotic, asymptotic structure is a boundary of the cylinder. It's just uh, Minkowski, it's a flat space. So you have a light cone. And now you can imagine that you, you added some matter here in the middle of ADS. So you can imagine sending signals either through the bulk, or you can imagine a signal through the boundary, next to the boundary. And the idea, uh, the theorems of Gao and Walt and the notion of symptotic causality is whenever you're going through the bulk, it can only slow you down. It cannot speed you up. You can, never, you can never go faster through the bulk than what is allowed by the boundaries. You cannot uh, arrive somewhere outside of the light cone. In the context of ADS CFT, it is especially clear because if you have two CFT correlators, then you know that the, the commutator should be zero when they're space-like separated. That's a notion of causality. So asymptotic causality is, uh, is this kind of notion, that asymptotic uh, correlators, uh, asymptotic operators should commute. And when you, go through the, uh, when you go through the bulk, it can only slow you down. Uh, simplest example, if you take, a, uh, so you can see that if you take a negative mass Schwarzschild, it will speed you up. But if you take a positive mass Schwarzschild, it will slow you down. And uh, this uh, slowing down, slowing down of signals when going through the bulk, it has a, it has a name. Uh, and this uh, slowing down is called uh, Shapiro time delay. So what is Shapiro time delay? Well, as you know, uh, there are three Uh, yes, and uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the idea is that we take this effective theory of gravity, gravity plus high derivative corrections, and we impose this asymptotic causality and see what are the constraints and the corrections. Um, what is a what is a Shapiro time delay? Well, as you as you might have heard, there are three classical tests of general relativity, which is. Uh, 
shift of mercury perihelion, deflection of light, and uh, gravitational redshift of light. And so in 1964, Shapiro posted a paper uh, called the force, force test of general relativity. And the, the idea is that if you send the signal to Venus or Mars and it reflects back when it passes by the sun, it will slow this signal down. And you can measure this effect. Uh, it's uh, th thousands or 10 to the minus fourth of, of a second, something of this order, I think. Uh, and this is an example of this slowing down when going through the bulk. So let me compute quickly for you uh, a Shapiro time delay. Uh, so let me consider a metric which corresponds to two Schwarzschilds. So it's, uh, I consider the metric which is um, a Minkowski space plus One to two. I added uh, two Schwarzschild solutions. Of course, it's not an exact solution of uh, Einstein equations for uh, usual two sources, but it's a good approximation, and uh, we can imagine doing that. And imagine I put, uh, say, I have some transverse plane. And I put one source at uh, impact parameter B and another source at impact parameter minus B, if you wish. And now we will send the particle from infinity passing between these two, two Schwarzschilds. So it will go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And because uh, it's a symmetric, it's symmetric, there is no deflection. Because there is symmetry. If you put one of them, there will be a deflection. But if you just uh, if you choose a symmetric configuration, what happens is the light does not deflect, but the uh, Shapiro time delay accumulates. So what we, will, what we will find is that we will now compute the time time it takes light to propagate from minus infinity to plus infinity in the presence and in the absence of um, of uh, these two masses. Let me do this computation. So there are this R i. So R1 is uh, simply, say, x uh, minus b. And uh, R2 is x plus b. x is it's the usual coordinates. Uh, now. Uh, we can imagine that uh, the, well, the, the problem, we can localize the problem in this transverse plane and study the propagation of light in this metric. So for, for light, this thing should be zero. And uh, say, uh, in this case, we can call this, very, this direction z. Then, uh, both uh, this r, r they, they are equal to b squared plus z squared. If I consider a position of the particle, um, then uh, this difference is simply b squared, and this is a coordinate z. So we get the equation of the type if we say that it's a if it says that it's a geodesic, we get that 1 minus 2 rs over r d minus 3. You can get it. Check that this is a correct thing. And gz square 1 plus 2 rs over r d minus 3 square over r square. So it's a little exercise to plug this and check that it's correct. And now from this, we can compute uh, uh, the change. Uh, well, we can find uh, delta t as the integral over dz from minus infinity to plus infinity. And we have a, uh, well, from this we get 
equation for dt over dz. We compute dt over dz at r minus dt over dz when rs is equal to zero, so it's just Minkowski. So this is a relative delay compared to propagation in flat space. Well, and you get uh, something which looks like uh, some numbers, which we don't care about, times over b to the d minus 4. Here's some number depends on d. So if you consider propagation of light, you get uh, is that uh, it's get delayed, and the delay is uh, 1 over b to the power d minus 4. An interesting exercise, which I will not do here, is to repeat the same thing for the, uh, for the particle which moves with velocity v. So here we've had a particle which moves with the speed of light. That was a photon. If you repeat uh, the change for the particle with the speed v, you will get that it's 1 over v, 1 over v. And here, curiously, you get minus delta t, delta t of photons. What, okay, what is this formula again? This is a Shapiro delay or advance for massive particles, which move with the velocity of v, which is expressed in terms of Shapiro delay of photons. Notice that there is a 1 over v square factor in the brackets. So when the particle is very slow, when v is small, the delta, delta t is, uh, is actually negative. So if you take a massive particle, it gets slow, it, it gets, it, uh, it, it travels faster. And there is a critical velocity after which you can get delay. The fact that this slowest, the fact that this uh, slow particles get Shapiro advance and they, they travel faster does not contradict to asymptotic causality because asymptotic causality is formulated in terms, of, in terms of the fastest signals, which is the light. And the light gets delayed here. But there is this curious fact. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. Let me, if you wish, let me write it. Uh, that's the right answer. Now, if you set v to 1, you recover delta t of photons. Thanks. This is a, this is a classic, uh, cl classic results from the 70s, which is a computation of a delay from a planet. When the, when the light passes by the planet, it gets delayed. If a slow particle passes by these two planets, it gets advanced. But uh, asymptotic causality structure only cares about the fastest signals, which are controlled by the propagation of light. And here we get uh, that uh, this Shapiro time delay is positive because the gravity is, attra is attractive. Now I would like to tell you about uh, the relativistic version of this argument. So imagine that we would like to propagate next to a relativistic planet which moves with the speed of light. Oh, it will, or just a, some photon. Then uh, uh, we can uh, consider a source in the Einstein equations, which corresponds to, um, let's say we have, as, as before, we have a uh, um, Minkowski space. where u minus whatever x uh, d minus 1 and v plus x d minus 1. And now we add a source to this. So imagine we have a relativistic source, which is, uh, is this. It's uh, some particle which moves along the light cone with some momentum pu, and it's localized in the transverse plane. 
there is a famous, um, uh, famous exact solution for this source. You can show that if you add, um, if you, two things. So there is a, uh, the exact solution is known, and uh, it's uh, usually to refer to the shockwave solution, or, yes, and uh, the, and this H you can find, it's uh, simply the same kind of H, that same kind of Shapiro delay we had, it's a number which depends on D, it's localized at U equals zero. And instead of Rs, which roughly measures the mass of a planet in the units of G, you have now the momentum of this source in the units of G, and you have the same R transverse in this space to the D minus four. Now, two comments. First is that uh, this is the exact solution to Feinstein equation. It's the first comment, not a linear. And the second comment is that uh, uh, actually you can find if you add any type of corrections to Einstein theory, you can write, write any polynomial terms, whatever you like, this is still an exact solution. That's a peculiar fact which uh, you might wonder about, and, but then I will try to explain another explanation why it's is not so maybe uh, surprising that uh, that it happens. In this uh, in this language, what happens now if we send another a probe along through the shock wave? Uh, what happens is that here is our particle. So the shock wave is localized at u equal to zero, and find a geodesic, if, and you will find that this particle jumps through. Uh, it's get shifted by some delta V. And uh, if you try to embed it in a global space of Minkowski, you see that in the, in the original Minkowski, that's what will happen. But now it's get delayed. It, it arrives later. So this delta V, which, uh, which simply, if you compute, is equal to G, P, U, and again, uh, B, D minus four times the number. Uh, is a relativistic Shapiro time delay. Okay, that's fine. We, it's a nice uh, shockwave solution. It's, uh, it's exact. So far, so good. There is something curious happening if we try to translate this computation. This is just, we computed a geo light geodesic passing through this exact solution. It is curious and instructive to repeat the same computation using the language of scattering amplitudes. Let me do this quickly for you. Uh, and uh, let me consider for this, uh, for this purpose, uh, an exchange. What is this? What is the physics of this? What is this? What is the physics of this geometry? Well, the physics is very simple. This uh, it's a propagation of one particle in the gravitational field of the other relativistic particle. In the language of scattering amplitudes, what we have is simply uh, this is a, say our probe. <coughs> this is a source. And they, uh, and they interact through graviton exchange. Let's imagine that all these particles are scalars. Then the result for this, Whit not Witten, but Feynman diagram, is simply 8 pg s square over t. That's, uh, you can check. And now let's, uh, let's compute the, uh, the phase shift. As I try to explain, if we, if we, if we these are wave packets with separation B, yes, and here, um, sorry, I had to explain, I, you could have asked what is B here? So this is a two plane and this, there is a transverse plane. And I consider the source at the origin of a transverse plane and I send a probe somewhere here, at the distance B. To avoid deflection, I can again consider two shocks which are symmetric, but 
I and neglect deflection for this purpose. So that's what is B here. And this is the same as the impact parameter, just by definition. Uh, now, uh, we had to do this, we do the integral of a transverse momenta, E i q b, and here we have s square minus q square. Remember that t is equal to minus q square. Well, this integral you can take, it's trivial to do. You will, rep you will get exactly the same uh, you'll get exactly the same d minus 4 times the same number. And if you re remember that s is something that like eu, which is the momentum of the source times the momentum of the probe, uh, and then you, uh, you can imagine that you start some plane wave, then you add this phase, then this phase can be recast as a PV times delta V. And this formula exactly coincides with this formula. So you can either do the classical geometry computation, or you can take the scattering amplitude, compute the phase shift, and then take a plane wave and propagate it with add to this phase shift. And you can see that the phase effect of this phase shift is exactly effect of shifting the wave packet by, um, by uh, amount delta V. So there is an equivalence between this computation with classical geometry and the scattering amplitude computation. However, uh, something uh, you can ask, what is, a, what is a dual to this fact? Remember, I told you that this is an exact solution in any theory of gravity, you can check. This geometry is very special. It has some special symmetries, such that it's protected against correction to the Einstein theory. What is the dual of this fact in the scattering, scattering amplitude language? And the, the answer to this is the following, that when you compute this integral, you can see, let me choose some, uh, uh, some B, some component, B1, Q1. You can compute this uh, integral by closing, closing the contour, and you see that the phase shift is controlled by the residue of the amplitude, of the amplitude at t equal to zero. However, there is a simple fact that if you have an exchange of the particle, you have a pole, obviously, at this position, say, there is a fact that the residue of the amplitudes at this pole is equal to the square of a three-point amplitude. This is an optical theorem for three-level amplitudes. The residue of the pole is the same as imaginary part. You have something like that. Uh, so this is, a, if you have heard about optical theorem, that is an optical theorem for three-level amplitudes. And, uh, and now, uh, since uh, this delta is controlled by the residues of the amplitude, you can ask, uh, what is this three-level amplitude? And uh, the curious fact about three-level amplitudes, which I will talk about next, is that they are completely fixed by symmetries up to a number. No matter what your theory is of gravity, just Lorentz symmetry fixes them. And in this way, uh, you see that Shapiro time delay is controlled by three-level amplitudes, and these three-level amplitudes are fixed by symmetries, no matter how you correct your theory. And this is a dual of this fact that this is an exact solution for any corrections to the, uh, to the theory. And after you realize this, you can ask the following question. Okay, let's now forget about the actions and geometries we're computing the objects which is completely fixed by three-point couplings. So we can take the general gravitational theory with three-point couplings, compute Shapiro time delay, and see what's going on in this most uh, generic case. This is, uh, this is the idea. Um, curious little comment. It's probably confusing for those who haven't uh, 
thought about this problem, but notice that uh, we start with a purely transverse momentum, so it's a Euclidean momentum, Q squared is positive in the physical domain, and then we are computing the residue at the point where Q squared is equal to zero. And we are computing it because we, uh, say, evaluate it in a complex plane somewhere. So let me rewrite it as a say, Q1 square plus Q transverse. And uh, the residue is at where it's equal to zero, so it's effectively Q1 becomes complex. And making, uh, you know, making a momentum uh, complex is the same as doing a weak rotation. When we go from Euclidean plane to to Minkowski space, we say take P naught to I P naught. So here, while doing this computation, effectively we switch from, say, Minkowski signature to the, what is called the um, mixed uh, signature, which is uh, two minuses and, say, pluses. Effectively, it's in quotes. And uh, this is related to the fact that uh, kinematically, if you consider, say, these are three massless particles. If you consider a decay of massless particles in Minkowski space, they are kinematically prohibited. So just write momentum, energy momentum conservation. You will see that the massless particle can only decay collinearly in, in Minkowski space. However, in a mixed signature, when we have two times, roughly, uh, that, that is allowed kinematically. And uh, the, the moral of this computation is that not on, so the moral of this computation is that the Shapiro time delay is controlled by effectively a computation as a, in mixed signature due to the simple fact that moreover it's fixed by three point amplitudes. So it's a very clean observable it, uh, because it's completely fixed by symmetries. That's why it is so nice to study. Let me explain why is a uh, little bit why the three-point amplitudes are universal. So let me consider now three-point amplitude. And you probably will hear a lot about them next week in the lectures by Marcus Spradlin. Um, universality, three-point, Amplitudes. Imagine that we have three massless particles, which, uh, which say one decay into two others. So we have momentum conservation. And uh, each of them is massless. Well, first, you can immediately see by taking square of this equation, move P2 or P3 to other uh, side and take a square. You see that uh, pi times pj is equal to zero. That's the first thing. And now, if we have a if we have a scattering with uh, which involves gravitons, as we discussed, let's say we have a graviton, then it should be uh, gauge invariant, which is that we should be we can sh we can shift this guy if there's some graviton with momentum p, we can shift it by p mu. Lambda nu plus lambda nu. Uh, now let's consider this process, which is two scalar particles interacting with a graviton. Uh, and let's try to write some amplitude. Let's say it's P1, P2, P3. Let's try to write some three point amplitude. Well, uh, the answer is that there is only one thing you can write. P1 nu, P2 nu. This uh, uh, and some number in front. That's it. That's, uh, that's the result in a full quantum gravity. There is nothing else you can have. This just follows from Lorentz invariance and gauge invariance. Uh, this lambda is a parameter of the theory. It's a, it's a coupling constant that you should measure in the experiment with its all loop corrections, et cetera. And uh, that was exactly the, when we were taking residues, 
we effectively sum over all the states of a graviton that we exchange. And so we get this uh, S square here by taking a square of two amplitudes, of three point amplitudes. You can repeat the same exercise for the, uh, for the gravitons. And let me write you the result. If you repeat uh, the same exercise for the gravitons, so now take three, three gravitons instead. The result is that the three-point amplitude for gravitons it has three structures. The one of uh, Einstein theory, the one of roughly Gauss Bonnet, and the one roughly of R cube. Riemann cube you can add to the uh, to the action. Yes, yeah, this is two scalars and a graviton. Yeah. Uh, notice that this is gauge invariant because if you shift epsilon by p, because of pi pj is zero, it is, it is gauge invariant. Um, and uh, here uh, I can put, uh, I can put quotes. Because it's really, what I'm using here is symmetry. I'm not using any particular action. It's completely robust. Because based on symmetry in any theory, in, in any theory of gravity, this is the, the answer. And now, uh, as I try to explain to you, the Shapiro, this phase shift, when we consider scattering for gravitons, is roughly given by this A3 square times 1 over b d minus 4. You can write a precise formula. Now you can start playing the following game. Imagine you have the most general three-point amplitude, and you, comp and you uh, we have a, so if this, if uh, the Einstein theory is 1, we have two corrections, alpha 2 and alpha 4, say. So Shapiro time delay is a function of alpha 2 and alpha 4. But it also, uh, it is also, since we are scattering, if we are scattering gravitons, it also is sensitive to the polarization tensors of our gravitons. You can polarize them differently. This was uh, something new compared to the scalars. Now you can ask, what is the condition that it's positive? And the answer, which I, it's a simple computation. You can, you know the three-point amplitudes. You take the same kind of integral. You compute, and you see that uh, if alpha 2 and alpha 4 are non-zero, then you get uh, the delta is negative, which is a violation of causality. Uh, now, uh, that's the first conclusion. So as soon as you, if you, if you, if you correct the three-point vertex of the gravitons, and it's, then you get into this trouble. It's the first thing. And a second, you can ask, how do I fix this problem? Well, one way to fix this problem is set these parameters to zero. That's fine. But that's a boring solution. And then you can say, okay, let's try to fix this problem by adding new particles. Almost done. Uh, and then you can show that uh, uh, the only way you can uh, fix this problem is by adding of particles with spin larger than two. Basically, you can repeat the same exercise. You start with three-point amplitudes of particles with some mass and some spin. Uh, and then you see that uh, unless if particles have spin two or less, they will not help you. That's the only guys that can help you as particles with spin larger than two. And then by this argument, which I discussed in the very beginning, that you cannot add one of them. If you add one of them, you violate this bound. You violate causality. Then you have infinite number of them. And, uh, and, and then uh, you can ask the following 
following bootstrap question. Imagine you have an amplitude, you have an amplitude with higher spin particles which generate phase shift which uh, does not grow faster than, than S according to this bound. And it's a unitary amplitude. What are the class of theories which, uh, what are the class of theories which have this property of higher spin particles? And uh, this is a bootstrap prob problem. It's completely rigorous mathematically. You should just be able to classify such theories. And uh, the hope is that these theories will be theories of strings, and there is some evidence to that. Uh, so let me reiterate, we consider this simple extension of this classical general relativity experiment, which is Shapiro time delay. We found that if you modify gravity in a very clean fashion, in a very gauge invariant fashion by changing the three vertices, generally we violate causality, and then the string modes naturally appear. Uh, the same experiment, uh, it doesn't matter, you can run in ADS or in the theater space. In cosmology, it doesn't, it's kind of insensitive to that. If we have these particles, we will have this problem. And uh, this is an example of this uh, um, bomb plant like question where we started with uh, corrections to the theory, and at first glance, it looks completely fine, but upon further investigation, we saw that there is some problem. Of course, it's almost classical. It would be great uh, to, uh, to have uh, get such bounds in a quantum level. And probably you heard recently about this weak gravity conjecture, which is exactly the same type of question. Thank you. Quest.